warm welcome to uh, Christ Church this morning. Some words from Proverbs. My son, if you receive my words and treasure up my commandments with you, if you seek it like silver and search for it as for hidden treasures, as for hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom. Here the uh, writer of the Proverbs, he, he speaks of how we should be searching, searching and looking for God's word and to seek him like treasure. And that's what some, we're looking at that this morning, how uh, we seek God, how we find God, or how he reveals himself to us. And we find it as we, we will see that it's a treasure, something of lasting value and worth having. Let's go.
of hearts be open, all desires to know, and from whom no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of thy Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love thee and worthily magnify thy holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the one Lord. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. <coughs> and the second is like, namely this, Thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Lord, have mercy upon us, and the right to all these thy laws in our hearts, we beseech thee. The Sunday before Advent. Stir up, O Lord, the wills of your faithful people, that they plentifully, bringing forth the fruit of good works, may by you be plentifully rewarded. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Today's Bible reading is taken from Matthew 13, verses 44 to 52. Matthew 13, 44 to 52. The parable of the hidden treasure. The kingdom of heaven is like this. A man happens to find a treasure hidden in the field. He covers it up again, and is so happy that he goes and sells everything he has, and then goes back and buys that field. The power of the power. Also, the kingdom of heaven is like this. It's like this. A man is looking for fine parts, and when he finds one that is unusually fine, he goes and sells everything he has and buys that part. of the net. Also, the kingdom of heaven is like this. Some fishermen threw their nets out in the lake and catch all kinds of fish. When the net is full, they put it to shore and sit down to divide the fish. The good ones go into their pockets, the worthless ones are thrown away. It will be that this at the end of the age the angels go out and gather up the evil people from among the good and will throw them into the fair, fairy furnace where they will cry and grind their teeth. You truths and old. Do you understand these things, Jesus asked them? Yes, they answered. So he replied, This means then that every teacher of the law who becomes a disciple in the kingdom of heaven it's like the owner of a house who takes new and old things out of his stone. That's every video of the
like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Well, we do want to know you and know you more um, and to grow in that understanding, grow in that knowledge of you and grow in following you. Help us uh, as we turn to your word, help us if we're new to the faith that you would uh, help us to know even better of uh, what Jesus offers and may we not miss out on all that he offers us. Help us to find treasure that lasts and to retain that in him. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. A um, hundred years ago, well, 2020, um, 1922, they, uh, there was a, an archaeologist uh, called Carter who was uh, digging in, the, in uh, the valley of, known as the kings and queens in Egypt and he was looking for something, looking for anything which is really valuable, anything that would point to uh, something of great value. And uh, he, he, with his team, had got pretty weary or, and were at the point of giving up with their search. And just at that point, a young water uh, fetcher, a young lad who was just fetching water flow, he stumbled across a rock which he had lifted, and that rock uh, hid, hid behind it a staircase which was leading to somewhere. And they continued with their ex excavation, and what it led to was the tomb of Tutankhamun and the riches of, of all the treasures that were, that were found in that. Well, um, the treasure that we find from God and through his word, Jesus tells us that is actually worth far, far more than that. If that was the greatest find that somebody could, could, could find, the treasure, well this is a treasure that is something even of greater value than that. And that is on offer. That is on offer to you and to me as we look at that this morning. <coughs> And there is, this is the parable of the hidden treasure and the pearl, and it's followed on by another parable as well. And they are far more of greater value than, than anything that the world can give us. Well, we we're going to spend some time looking at these verses, and I'm sure it will benefit by that. They are given for us because, because God wants us to... to get his treasure, to not lose out. He has given it for us and he wants us to make sure we, we get that, we get his treasure and not lose out. Well, it is just in these three verses and he tells us about this treasure. When you think of all um, the words in, in the Bible, it's just in these three verses it, uh, it, it boils, boils it down to. The kingdom of heaven is like this, a man happens to find a treasure hidden in the field, he covers it up again and, it so, and is so happy that he goes and sells everything he has and then goes and buys, uh, goes back and buys that field. Also, the kingdom of heaven is like this, a man is looking for fine pearls and when he finds it that is unusually fine, he goes and sells everything he has and buys that pearl. Well, in these two parables, there are, there are some similarities and there are some differences. Well, the, the differences are that uh, this, the first man hits upon the, tr the treasure by accident. He's just there digging in this field. It doesn't seem like he's gone there to, to dig for treasure, but he happens to find it by accident. He's not searching for it. Maybe it's, it's like... Um, uh, maybe not, not even like the, the people who, who, who we might sometimes see on a beach with their metal detectors hoping to, to uh, hear a buzzer go off when, when, they, when they have something under the sand. But this, this guy was, wasn't, doesn't seem to be going looking for that, but he hits upon treasure, and, which is very different to the other person who is um, the, the, the first guy was, was probably not um, a rich man either, the fact that he was out in the field digging. 
the, the second person is rather a pearl expert. He is, must be a merchant or a trader, and he is actually on the lookout. He is a kind of antiques expert. He is a jewellery expert. He knows what he's looking for, and he, he is he is, is looking amongst other pearls, and he finds this um, this amazing pearl, this this incredible pearl. So, so there are differences in these two two men. Um, the way, just the way they are and, and the way that they come upon this treasure. But there's also that which is common in both of them. They both find something of enormous value. They both realise that this is of an uh, amazing value. That is, it is a, a huge thing of huge worth. Now, it, it was um, not everyday banking, but they didn't have uh, banks that, uh, that, we, that we would have. Perhaps they would have somebody who was wealthy, who had a, a big strong house, um, that they could, who would look after something valuable for them. But generally, people, uh, one of the ways that they, they kept their treasures, if they had uh, treasures like coins or, um, uh, or, or jewellery, they might put it in a clay pot and hide it somewhere in a, in a certain field. And in, the, in, that, in Palestine, in those areas, it was common for different groups to, to come in, different um, kind of uh, takeovers in, at that time. And so there, there would be clashes and conflicts, and people would die in battle. And, and so they wouldn't return to that, to that place. That there would be treasure hidden in a, in a field, and um, where somebody had buried it and gone off to war, and, and it was left there. And here, this man finds this by accident, where somebody has left that treasure in that, in that field. It was almost like a common occurrence, the way they, they looked after money in that way. But also, a pearl. Um, people didn't find pearls so, so easily. That there wasn't the, the breathing equipment so that they could dive down and, um, and go down to the depths and, and, and look for the amazing pearls. So, so somebody finding a pearl of great value from the depths, that would have been amazing that, uh, that they, they, could, they could find a pearl which it, where nobody had seen, nobody had disturbed before, for somebody to find that. So, so even the recovery of a pearl like that would have, would have been quite something. So here, both of these are instances where, where uh, they recognised the person who's digging recognises this is of great value. The pearl merchant who has been looking for that, he sees that this pearl is unique. It is not the same as anything else. And he also recognises the great value of that. They also have a real joy in finding out. When they make that realisation of this is treasure, when they open their eyes and say this is what I found, there is a whole real sense of joy, a real sense of uh, joy of expression in, in what they've seen and what they've found. This is something totally amazing. This is a total revelation to them. And they are willing to take steps immediately to keep it for themselves, to take ownership for themselves. Both of them do that. They want to take the right steps to make sure it is comes under their, their, their ownership, that they it belongs to them. And what Jesus is pointing out is that his kingdom is like that. His kingdom is like this treasure or this pearl. That um, some people may just come upon it accidentally, but others may come upon it because they're purposefully searching for God, searching for his kingdom. They are wanting, to, wanting to, to, to find God and they are looking for him. Well, the, Jesus is showing also that actually the, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom that he brings in, is accessible, that uh, it's brought near. Even right at the start of Jesus' preaching, after his baptism, he says the kingdom of heaven is near, that it's brought to you. It's brought close at hand, it's, a, it's close to you, it's brought within our orbit. But 
But even though he's brought it close to us, he's brought it from heaven down to earth, even though he's brought it close to us, it is hidden. It is hidden uh, from normal revelation. And we can't just see it. So just like the guy going to the field, he would have thought that this is just an ordinary field. I've got my work to do. I've got to be here digging. Um, I've got to be planting or whatever else that he was doing on that field. He's getting on with the business. And, and um, it is just ordinary. It is hidden. The kingdom of heaven, Jesus is saying, is, is hidden. It isn't out there in spotlights, but it is not marked out in that way. And you find it also in unexpected places. And people are shocked at where they find it. That it is unexpected. It, it won't be right there in the open. It won't be in, in spotlights. It, it, not great big banners showing this is where the kingdom of God is. Uh, like those treasure maps you know, with the big cross, this is where you'll find it. When just um, under a month's time, we're going to be celebrating Jesus' birth and his, his, birth, his coming to the world. And when he was born, he was not born in a palace. He was born in an out-of-way place, in a hidden-away town. Jesus grew up not in a big city where he could be known by everybody, but in a tiny place called in Nazareth, in a country place. He was not a person who would be known for having a great influence. He didn't have big religious status or recognition or wealth. When you think of even Mary and Joseph taking, uh, taking the gifts for um, the purification after his birth. It was only two doves. It was, it was the gift of a poor family. And he was he learned the trade of a carpenter. He was in ordinary humble uh, beginnings, ordinary humble life. There was nothing flashy about him, nothing that people would expect that this is the kingdom of God which has come here, which has come here on, on earth. But even in the midst of all of that, as he began his ministry, people recognized that this was, there was something special about him. There was something of value. There was something um, greater than what we find around. And even his disciples, as they came to him, they recognized and they began to follow him. Even that, that pearl, that unique pearl, was hidden amongst all the other pearls. But here, some people recognized the value and its worth they saw its worth. Well, that is a reminder to us, isn't it? That if it's hidden, we can miss it. If something is hidden, we can miss it. That uh, we can miss something which is so valuable. There are some of those puzzles on there, um, especially getting to Christmas as people send around various things. There are those pictures with um, where you have to look closely at the picture and um, it's kind of, you know, can you find a person's face or can you find uh, this, the cat in this picture or something, you know? And you have to look carefully. Um, I'm not that great at some, there's some of those pictures. Um, I, I can look, look and uh, I, I might see a nose some, some, sometimes um, or part of a face, but I, I can't figure, figure it out. It all merges. But sometimes when you have that, you need somebody to point it out to you. Somebody who, who is much more artistic, who can point out, look, this is the shape there. And sometimes some people need that to point out, this is where the kingdom of God is, a helper like that. It is hidden, it is hidden amongst other things. But also, it is hidden and we need to be able to pick it out. There, there isn't the big hallmarks all the time. And the sad thing is, the world walks by the kingdom of God daily. As if Jesus has brought it within our reach, the world is walking by the treasure of the kingdom day by day. And the reason that they walk away from it, even people in churches walk by it 
and they miss it totally. It's because the way that we look at things, we are just so blind to the way that we look at things. But we are formed by our culture, we are formed by our desires, and we miss the big thing which is right there in front of, front of us. One well, of the things that we want to look at are things are which, are which are wonderful big signs. We're looking at things that impress us, things that draw us, things that excite us. We're looking at things that's going to do something for us. And that's the wrong way of looking at it. It's a long, wrong type of attraction. It's a wrong type of way of looking at things. Because God wants us to look at things the other way. He wants us to seek His glory. He wants us to seek Him, to seek uh, things from, from His understanding. That's the problem with uh, our social media, isn't it? When you look at uh, Facebook or Instagram or all these different posts, that they're all about how impressive can I be? What can I put on there? which is going to be an attraction, which is going to draw, which is going to be make it big for me. And sadly, many of our young people and others, they, they fall into that trap because they feel they have nothing to offer which makes them big and special. They can't match up to it. And so they get discouraged, uh, disillusioned, that they are just ordinary, they have nothing to offer, which is not true. All of us have something to offer. All of us are made unique and wonderful by God. But that's a wrong way of looking at it. The, um, the, some of the big faults with our, in, our social media side of it is, is that, isn't it? Uh, the world looks at those things in a big way. But we are not to be looking at that. We can miss it. We can miss the kingdom of God because we are looking at things by the way the world sees them. And, it, they, and the world sees the wrong, wrong things and Christians even miss God at work because they are looking at the wrong things. They want the wrong things from God. They want that which is impressive, that which is flashy, that which is polished, that which is excellent. <coughs> and it isn't like that. He was born in a, in a manger, was he? He was born in obscurity. Nobody knew much about Jesus in his time. He didn't make big waves. But yet, yeah, that was the kingdom of God. In um, the New Testament, as you look at, um, at uh, even um, the words of Peter, he writes this in, in his letter. Prophets prophesied about the grace that is yours. They searched and they inquired. The angels from heaven longed to look. So what he's saying is that all the prophets of the Old Testament, they were looking forward, they really were eager that God would reveal to them his gospel. They were eager and they were longing for that. And that even the angels from heaven, they were eagerly searching. He's saying the angels longed to look. But it was only to us that God showed us the glory, the riches, the treasure in the Gospel. And that was by Jesus dying on the cross, the glory of his sufferings. Even, even the angels longed to find that treasure, to, to be revealed to them. And even the prophets longed and they were searching, they were, they were hoping in their generation that God would re reveal the fullness of his truth. But it's for us that in our time we can look back and we can see that Jesus came, that the treasure has been revealed. It's been revealed by Christ and his sufferings. If it's so close and so often People miss it. They miss it because they want something for themselves. They want something of, of theirs rather than seeking God and how he's done it. He's done it in a way that is hidden. The treasure is hidden. And um, that 
is what's shown here in these parables. The treasure gives joy upon seeing it, upon realising that it's a treasure. Both these guys are so happy, and uh, even before they get it, they have to go and do certain things, and they go and do that. They, it says, they, he goes and sells everything that he has. They take steps immediately to go and get that treasure. They are so joyful at what they found. There's no sense of resentment uh, or grumpiness about it. They just go immediately. And also, the treasure brings about total change in their lives. It changes their hearts as they realise what they found and they take those practical steps. So they plan, how can I get that treasure? So the man in the field, he goes and he plans of how he can get enough together in order to purchase the field. And he goes and secures that in order that he can uh, take ownership of that treasure for himself. The pearl merchant, he goes and sells everything as well that he has in order to, to get that pearl of great value. They are captured by it, they're captivated in their hearts by it, and they go and they are sold out in order that they get that treasure. They live for that itself. That is so important. That becomes their number one priority. That everything else takes second place to that. There's no hedging their bed state, there's no kind of I'll put this by for as a reserve. None of that is totally giving for that treasure in order that they get that treasure. I wonder whether Christ has won you over in that you see him as being such that treasure. He is so important, he is so fascinating that you, you're, you, you see his worth that you would never give up on that, that you would never lo want to lose that in any way. That is the treasure that, that we are given in Christ. He is so worth it. There is no moderate response to Jesus. There is no half-heartedness. There is no one day in seven. It has got to be 24 hours. You have to be sold out for him or you have to hate him. You know, you can't be both. There is no halfway or sitting on the line, on the, on the, you know, on the, on the fence. It is total commitment to him. That is what it's like when we find that treasure. It's a whole life change. Jesus brings total change. That's what we see with both those guys. And this is the priceless pearl. The treasure is that priceless pearl. The treasure is Jesus, the kingdom, and they are wholehearted in all that they do. Well, have you found that? Have you, does that excite you in Jesus, that he is worth that? He is worth everything. Because if he isn't, maybe there is something more that you still need to be looking for. Perhaps you've missed something of that, that novelty, it's gone, the shine is gone, there's something that you need to capture. And he, his encouragement is keep looking, keep looking for that. Because if you are looking, you will find it. Seek and you will find. He wants you to keep on looking and to seek him and he will grant you the desires of your heart. To seek him first, to look for him as your treasure. Well, in following that, um, Matthew has this parable of the dragnet. And here, this is, this is quite a contrast to, to the treasure. This is more about judgment, judgment on the last day. Here, this, this, this uh, parable is a parallel to what we saw a few weeks ago about the wheat and the weeds. Of, uh, of the kingdom of God growing in the midst of the kingdom of the world. The wheat and the weeds growing together. But one day there is a separation. And here again, this is the same account of judgment, 
but it, with the picture of fishermen with a dragnet. The dragnet covered a wide area of the lake and as the fishermen laid it out, they would draw in a huge amount of fish, various uh, kinds of fish, everything that could be drawn in with the net. When the net is full, they pull it to the shore and sit down to divide the fish, it says. The good ones in, into the buckets and the worthless ones are thrown away. Everything, that not, not everything that they catch in that dragnet would be suitable for consumption even within their Old Testament law. There was that which they should eat uh, and they could eat and that which they shouldn't eat. That which, which was clean and that which, which was unclean. And here, um, this, this may have been just also as a picture of um, Jesus when he sent out the, the fishermen as being fisher, fishers of men, that uh, of showing that, that there will be a gathering at the end of time, that he will gather um, all who, who uh, are to be brought to him for the, for the judgment of sin, who, those who are his and those who are not. Well, here in this, this sorting, it is Jesus with the angels who does that sorting. God is doing the sorting at the end of time. It will be like this at the end of the age. The angels will go out and gather up the evil people from among the good, and they will throw them into the fiery furnace where they will, cr they, they will cry and gnash their teeth. That at the end of the age, the Son of Man will send out his angels and there will be a judgment, there will be an accountability, and there is a sorting of good and evil, of the righteous and the unrighteous. Just like the wheat and the weeds, the world is made of different kinds of people. There are those who are, have turned their hearts to God, and those who have turned against God. And we all fall in those categories. We are all in one of those categories. And at the end of time, it's, it's when God will do that separation. Now we can't escape that. And um, people will deny that. People, even within the church, they kind of think that uh, everybody is a child of God, that uh, he will not dis discard anybody. But that, that's, there's nothing of what Jesus teaches regarding that. He shows very clearly of good and evil, of the righteous and the unrighteous. It is, he is so concerned about that separation of good and evil that he goes to the cross to deal with that good and evil. He can't merge those two together, that they, they will suddenly become one. He goes to the cross in order that the unrighteous, those who are unrighteous, can be made righteous. And he has to suffer for that. He has to suffer the sins of the unrighteous at the cross. He has to die. He has to suffer. He has to take the punishment on the cross of judgment. And he has to do that. If good and evil didn't matter, there would be no, ne no need for the cross. But because there is that, that we are unrighteous before God, sin needs to be dealt with. And Jesus is the only one who can deal with that. He sees the importance. He sees the clarity of good and evil. And so even church leaders who kind of wash that over, who just preach God is love and love will win in the end. It doesn't. It, love means that there has to be that separation of good and evil. This is the most loving person telling us that. That there is a judgment to come. And now if we fear that, if we fear that the net is closing in on us, that um, are we going to be caught up with those who are unrighteous? Well, the Gospel tells us that if we accept his Gospel, that, if, that he died for us, 
that he died for my sin, my unrighteous behaviour, my unrighteous thoughts. If he died for that on the cross, then I am saved, I am rescued from that. I am brought into those who are righteous. I am saved, I escape his judgment, the punishment for his judgment, because he has taken it for me. Peter writes that he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. Through all of those parables in Matthew 13, where Jesus talks about the kingdom of God, there's always this aspect of being God's person, of choosing him, of being the good seed, of being um, that which allows him to, to develop in our lives, his spirit to grow in our lives, to bring, bring crop. And at the end, there is um, that opportunity that we need to give account to God. But the wonderful thing is that we can have righteousness in him. In uh, uh, the words of Paul to the Romans, he says, for the power of God for the gospel is the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes, first to the Jew and then for also for the Greek. For in it is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. That in the gospel, just in the gospel, is the righteousness which we need is given to us. That Jesus died on the cross for us. That is the very simple message. But that is the treasure. That is what every person needs in order that we are accepted as righteous. And suddenly, people will buy it. People despise it. People think it's not important enough. They want something deeper. They want something well, which is going to do something more for them. But that is what we need. If Jesus, as the great surgeon, says, this is what you need for that surgery to make you whole, what, what, what are we to, to reject that? It is just the gospel, the simple gospel that we need. And Jesus goes on to finish by these words. He says, uh, to finish up all of these parables, that the true teacher of the law brings out treasure from the old to the new, like a, a person with, which, who has a, a house full of treasures, both old antiques and new treasures. He says that he is the one um, who is the true teacher of the law. Just like Moses brought in redemption from, from Egypt, uh, came through him, Jesus brings that redemption, but a greater redemption, and taking us into heaven to eternal life. As Moses gave the laws, Jesus is the one who comes to fulfill the laws. He is the new treasure. He fulfills what has been done. He meets the law's full, full demands. He has obeyed it to the utmost. As, jo as Joshua took people through the Jordan, where there was that baptism as they, as, uh, they walked through the waters of, of the Jordan, Jesus has walked us through the waters of baptism, of death. He's gone through death in order uh, and, and has been brought back to life in order that we can be raised to life in Him. So He is the real teacher of the law, the true teacher of the law. And to come to Him as the one who is the way and the truth and the life. If you are seeking Him, if you long for Him, if you continue to look to Him, you will find Him. That is the truth. That is His, his promise to you and I. That the kingdom of God has come close to us. That for those who desire it, who seek it through His Word, who seek it through the hiddenness of the world around us, that you will find it. And when you find it, you will know in your heart you will know that this is real, this is true, and this is so meaningful that it will change your life completely and others around you will know that it's changed your life as well. Let me pray.
but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Father, how we can just think the gospel and the mundaneness of day-to-day -day life is, is just so ordinary that we can miss out on the treasure and the riches that you give. Help us to realise how important your good news is. That is good news for everyone. Good news that changes us. Good news that is radical. Not just for now, but for eternity. Help us to reevaluate our lives in light of that. And help us to have that joy which comes from knowing you. Amen. Let's say together, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day He rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for your presence among us today. We thank you for the gift of life. Thank you for every blessing you have granted us. Thank you for protecting and keeping us in all our ways. Father, we pray for our pastor, Les, Lynn, and BCC members. Let them recognize the voice of the Spirit in everything they do in the church. We pray for the church wardens, music group, science person, Sunday school, and youth group. I entrust all the church members in your care. You fulfill their heart's desire for the trust in you. We pray for everyone in positions of power and influence in the government officials in their decision making concerning your people. We ask you to grant wisdom and understanding to them so that they can make the best decisions suitable for the community. Thank you for the peace we enjoy. Give peace to all the nations at war. We pray for Israel, Palestine, Ukraine, and Russia. I pray for peace, love, and unity within our homes. Let your Holy Spirit prevail in our homes and families. I pray for all those who are sick and not feeling well. We pray for Jada, Winsome, Margaret, Richard, and Raj, who had suffered a stroke recently. Lord, be with them. Heal them with your healing hand, O Master. We pray for the buried, Joyce, and William. Send your comfort, peace, and your calming presence. Give hope to those who feel lonely and without hope. We pray for the homeless people, asylum seekers, and refugees. Help them to find shelter and protection under your wings. We pray for the persecuted believers. Give them your protection. We pray for the outreach mission, drop-in, Bible study, dance class, Bible society, and all the missionary work supported by our church. We also pray for the people who work in public and private sectors and those who work for NHS. Be with them. Thank you, Jesus, for listening to our prayers. We ask all this in the mighty name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.
Jesus, I'm glorious.